Imagine you're a newly elected MP. You've won an election. Now what? You've been door knocking for ages. Fundraisers, speeches, so many late nights. You've been running on adrenaline, day to day, hour to hour, right to the last minute. It's been a while since you've seen your loved ones. But here you are, you won. Your community has chosen you to represent them in Ottawa. You've got a new job, one that might have you traveling across the country every few days, one that has you helping to run a country of almost 40 million people. And you start now. How are you feeling? Elated? Exhausted? What's the first thing you need to do? How does this all work? I'm Sabrina Dellen, and this is Humans of the House. We're taking you inside the House of Commons through real stories from former members of Parliament. At the Samara Centre, we've been doing exit interviews with former MPs for a long time. Because an exit interview happens after someone leaves a job, so they can really share what's on their minds. In our first episode, we met the 12 former MPs you'll hear in this series. I'm Catherine McKenna. Kennedy Stewart. Scott Bryson. Lisa Ray. Selena Caesar Chaban. This episode, we're going to introduce you to Parliament Hill through their eyes. Here, they'll walk you through their first days in office. In this podcast, we're talking to former MPs who served at some point in the last two parliaments. So people who left office between 2015 and 2021. For many of them, especially the Liberals. Sunny ways, my friends, sunny ways. This was their introduction to Ottawa. It's time for a change in this country, my friends, a real change. From Global News, that's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau giving his victory speech in October 2015. The promise of change was in the air. Remember the slogans? Because it's 2015. (laughs) Well, you probably remember that one, captured here by the Canadian press. Earlier, we heard why all these MPs made the leap into politics, a field that most of us can be pretty skeptical about. And honestly... A lot of these MPs were initially skeptical too. That's why the idea of doing politics differently really appealed to Selena Caesar Chavan. I was running with a government that said they were bold, transformative. Um, diversity is our strength. Add women, change politics. This is going to be transformative for Canada, right? When she was sworn in as the Liberal MP for Whitby, Ontario, she was determined to represent bold change. I come into Ottawa with the family, we're staying at the Delta, and I have a suitcase with stuff that I brought. And then I started thinking, I need to be Selena here. Everybody's gonna take their picture, like the class photo. In the suits, in the gray or the black or the blue, they're going to be very structured, very sort of similar. And I already knew that I was going to stand out. I was the only black woman elected out of 338 people. So I Selenified the first picture and came in in a leather Karl Lagerfeld dress and a, a faux fur gilet and my BCBG stilettos. It was snowing so hard <laughs> that day. I just didn't understand. It was so cold. But I selena it. I was like, this is it. Like, this is how you represent for the class of 2015. I had some challenges, but I was running with a bold, transformative government who said diversity is our strength, add women, change politics, not dress like it's business as usual. So I was like, you got to show them that you're ready to go. You got to sh- you got to show up and glow up. 
Now this room is totally packed. People are sitting and I'm at the front of the room. The reading room has this massive framed picture of the Fathers of Confederation. And my uncle looks at it and he looks at, you know, this, he'll always see me as a little girl, black girl from Grenada in her leather and her stilettos and totally looking not like a politician under this very, very specific picture. And he just said, like, you know, the audacity of this young woman to be here. And when he said it at the time, I was kind of like, yeah, you know, that's kind of cool. But when I reflected back on it, I said, yeah, like, you really have to be audacious. You really have to be bold to step into a space in a very specific way, knowing you have a sort of this, it sort of set the tone for the entire four years. Hold on to that audacity in your mind. Think about what it takes to make an impact when you come in fresh to an age-old institution like this. We'll hear more from Selena later. MPs arrive ready to work. They're taken around on tours, go to lots of seminars with former ministers and MPs, and there's an orientation program organized by the House administration. You get to go over to the Governor General's residence, um, be welcome there. That's Kennedy Stewart. He was the NDP MP for Burnaby South and until recently served as mayor of Vancouver. What's the training like when you first arrive? What's the first thing they show you, tell you? How are you received? Yeah, I mean, on the parliamentary side, they do a really good job. However, that's a very small part of the job. The party doesn't do a lot of onboarding. A, a few events where you might meet people, but not really, how do I manage my new staff? How do I hire them? How do I open an office? How, not, not really much of that at all. How do you open an office? Good question. Because every MP needs at least two, one in Ottawa and one in their riding. Thankfully, the first one is taken care of. Every MP is assigned their Parliament Hill office. But before you can start serving your community, you have to find and lease an office space in your riding. It's like starting a small business when you already have a desk job in Ottawa. And if you're wondering, well, what about that last MP? Can't they just pass their office on to the new one? That's not standard practice. The biggest problem I had was opening an office. I couldn't find office space in North Burnaby that was suitable. So it actually took me about eight months to get my office open. And I had to work out of another MP's office, uh, Peter Julian, who was uh, in Burnaby as well. And then constituents are kind of wondering, well, where's your office? <laughs> and, and you still haven't had it open, plus dealing with your parliamentary duties. So there was a lot going on at that time. On top of finding office space, you have to find the people. You need a handful of staff for both offices. That's where experience with hiring comes in handy. MPs come from lots of different career backgrounds. In this podcast alone, you're hearing from entrepreneurs, artists, professors, activists, journalists. And this is a great thing. Representing all Canadians takes all types. But this also means MPs are coming to their jobs with wildly different skill sets. Some MPs we spoke to had been bosses and managers, and some were hiring people for the first time. And an MP's training doesn't tend to make up for these gaps. Catherine McKenna was a human rights lawyer when she entered politics. In 2015, when she was elected to represent Ottawa Centre, she was also named Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. And I was thrust into a very high profile role where I had to immediately go off um, for the negotiations around the Paris Agreement. So I had to staff three offices um, and I had literally no idea how to do it. Oh yeah, if you're a cabinet minister, you need a third office. Maybe I missed some of the training. But I think a lot of it was very functional. It was like, how do you use like a computer? It seemed very old school, that kind of stuff, and not particularly helpful, just very bureaucratic, but very little time spent on how to be a very good MP. I felt that there certainly could be a lot more training. I found it very hard. 
And it took a very long time to get into a rhythm with both being a minister, of course, but actually even putting that aside, being a, a member of parliament and then also being a parliamentarian and figuring that out and also figuring out the staffing and how to properly serve the community. The Samara Centre surveyed MPs about these early days on the job. These are people on our team reading real comments from MPs. It was all fascinating, but it felt like we were being prepared to be important instead of how to do the nuts and bolts of our job. It was a lot of information at once. Worst part of my political career. I really needed a mentor and someone to share with me the pitfalls of bad staffing choices and where and when to hire good staff. Kennedy Stewart learned to dodge these staffing pitfalls early. What happened was, uh, and I'd have new MPs watch out for this, some of the senior MPs that have troublesome staff, they'll try to offload them onto your offices. That wasn't great. They didn't end up working with my office, but but that is actually something I saw happen quite regularly. If there was a, a troublesome staff person that either you know wasn't doing their job or was problematic, um, sometimes the senior the senior MPs would say, "Oh, take this staff person to work for you," and then you're kind of saddled with them. Ideally, you want staff who can show you the ropes, who know how Ottawa works, or have roots in the riding they're serving. Here's Robert Falconoulet on what he learned about hiring as a new MP for Winnipeg Centre. I know some MPs had difficulty in some of the hiring uh, that goes on in the office because sometimes you hire and someone will say, oh, don't hire your campaign staff. They might not be good in a constituency office. But why? What are they exactly dealing with? And it depends. Every riding is a little bit different, obviously. But my riding is huge issues with immigration, poverty, welfare issues people who are looking for pardons, uh, drug addiction issues. I could have used someone who is a counselor, mediation techniques, uh, someone who has experience dealing with immigration. You know, you have to hire, hire for that. And you kind of want someone who's also political, that they're always kind of thinking of it from a political perspective, like, uh, does it fit within what we're able to accomplish? Like the needs of the riding and the needs of Ottawa are two very different things. And as an example, my, one of my staff, political scientist, loves politics, studied all the books, associations, a lot of groups want to meet with you to talk to you about, you know, cattle farming, grains, fish markets, you know, aerospace. To be honest, very important industries in Manitoba. But I have no cattle farms in Winnipeg Centre. It's an urban, urban riding. There's no fish farming. We have other issues which are far more important. And so my staff was setting up all these meetings with these people, the dairy farmers of Canada. You know, I'm sitting across from the dairy farmers and they're telling me about their problems. And I'm thinking to myself, not that I don't care, but I have like, I'm going to have like a limited amount of time today to deal with issues. And I had to go back to the staff and say, hey, you know, I don't think we're doing this well. While all this setting up is happening, MPs go from the frying pan into the fire. New MPs get some serious wake-up calls. Welcome to running a G7 country where decisions can have international ramifications. Big ones. I remember the first day I was sworn in to Parliament and we had a vote that day. And the vote was whether or not to send troops into Syria. This is Adam Vaughan from Spadina, Fort York, a riding in downtown Toronto. As I was walking to Parliament Hill, I got a call from my, my teenage son at the point, <clears throat> only about 13 or 14. He said, Papa, don't go to war. And I suddenly realized I'd, I'd been so focused on delivering an, an urban strategy with housing and, and, and advancing the needs of cities that I, I hadn't really turned my attention to, you know, the full range of issues you, you get up in Ottawa. And I hadn't really contemplated what would happen when, you know, an issue like a pipeline for sale came up or, or the decision of whether or not to send troops and Canadians to war. And it suddenly dawned on me that I had a bit of learning to do. But then I, it became equally apparent to me that I didn't know which way the party was actually going to vote on this issue. In fact, the caucus didn't know. When Adam says caucus, he means a meeting of all his liberal colleagues. That decision had been mulled over by the leader's office for, for a couple of weeks as the issue emerged. And we were finding out that day in caucus what we were going to be doing that afternoon in Parliament. And I was going to have to cast a vote. 
And was I going to, on my very first vote, defy the leader or not? Luckily, the, the decision we reached was the one I, my son advocated for, and I got to <laughs> say, "Don't worry, kid, I'm not, I'm not sending you off to war." But it was, it was a learning curve around party discipline, around how caucuses worked, around how parliament worked, around the range of issues that you have to be up to speed on. Three years earlier in 2011, Kennedy Stewart had the same kind of welcome to Ottawa. I remember one of the first votes that I had was on Libya, intervening in Libya, <laughs> and whether or not we were going to send fighter jets, I think, and uh, bombers to Libya. This concerned Canada's involvement in a NATO-led mission. It was like one of our first or second votes in the House, and it needed to be unanimous. I was asked by our defense critic like how I was going to vote, and I said, well, I'm going to vote against it. I don't, I don't agree with this which I didn't realize was really offside with what uh, everybody was going to do. So then later in the evening, the MP came back to me and said, well, what would it take for you to vote yes? And I said, well, if there was more medical aid on the ground from Canada, then I would think about supporting it. And then it happened. <laughs> so I, I couldn't believe like, uh, oh, I see. So if you kind of stand your, well, what I, what was great is we were able to get, uh, you know, more aid on the ground, the thing I believed in, but I didn't realize that would also cause ripples in my party as, as kind of tagged me as a, as a problem, as a, you know, maybe somebody who was independently minded, let's say. Um, so, so there's all of that going on at the same time where you're trying to hire staff and trying to understand your portfolios. So not only are you dealing with huge decisions right from the get-go, you also have to learn the rules of your party. It's only orientation, and already your leader and peers are forming an impression of you. This is especially important because reputation and relationships have strong currency in Parliament. Adam Vaughan again. I suddenly found myself inside a caucus for the first time, and it was something which I'd covered politically. And I've been a journalist on the Hill. I've been a journalist at Queen's Park. Um, it's something which I'd seen, conversations with politicians who privately said one thing while their party said something else. But now I was actually navigating that space. And I was navigating that space as an outsider and a newcomer to the party, not as someone who had had you know, five elections under my belt and gone through leadership campaigns and, and you know, been caucus liberal clubs and built relationships all my time. I was alone in that environment. But I'd also come into the party uh, as sort of a ray of hope. So it was a very interesting moment in time. That walk to, to Parliament Hill that morning was a real wake-up call, a real bell-ringing moment. So that's just a taste of how intense your first few weeks in office can be. No one waits for you to figure things out. As an MP in our survey put it, The life of a parliamentarian and her team is life in the fast lane. Once you get going, it's hard to slow down. Best to overprepare us for the journey before we get going. Treat this seriously. If you want to strengthen democratic resilience and enhance the retention and attraction of diverse candidates. Research shows that for any workplace, a bad onboarding experience is terrible for retention. On the flip side, a good process for new hires keeps people around, improving retention by 82% and productivity by over 70%. For MPs, the sooner they know the ropes, the more effective they can be at their jobs, representing us and navigating policy decisions. This is where MPs have some detailed suggestions for improving training. Here's Kennedy again. I would definitely have uh, more management training. You know, if, if you've never directly hired or managed people, which is often the case with lots of MPs, you know, I would make sure that folks get that kind of training uh, before they start hiring because we had some people hire family members, for example, which ended up being hugely problematic. There needs to be training right at the beginning for that. And I would think that all parties structure their offices differently. So it might have to be custom made depending on the, on the party that you're in. Here are more thoughts from our survey. Onboarding needs to be an ongoing activity, not just a seven-day fire hose of information in the first week. For many new MPs with no political experience, people are not even sure what questions they're supposed to ask. Treat it like Frosh Week, a window of opportunity to give practical, diverse guidance. 
offer multiple opportunities for dialogue with former parliamentarians, offer certification courses on HR, finance, self-care, Indigenous relations, diversity, equity, inclusion, offer sessions on how to get done and follow up bi-weekly or weekly for the first six months until MPs feel settled. The more that is put into better equipping MPs, the better overall results we will get. Sabrina, can we back up for a second? Yeah, sure, Elena. What's up? So those MPs, Adam Vaughn, Kennedy Stewart, they were talking about voting on Canada's actions in Libya and Syria, but I'm not sure what that means. What are they voting on? Glad you asked. Let's call in our team. Hey, Beatrice. Hi, Sabrina. Beatrice, fill me in here. What is a vote? (laughs) How do votes work? What are MPs voting on? So in the case of Adam and Kennedy, they're voting on motions, um, which are proposals or requests that if they're adopted, they guide the business of the House. They get the House to either take an action or express a stance on an issue. So Adam was taking an action in terms of whether or not to have troops in Syria, but it could be something as basic as a particular stance that the House of Commons is taking. So is this the same thing as when the House votes on a bill? No. Okay. So bills are proposals for laws, a new law or an amendment to an existing law. Hmm. Motions direct the business of the House, but they're not the law of the land like a bill. The process for a bill is more complicated because of that, because it becomes the law. So it can start in either the House or the Senate, um, but then there's a three-stage process that it has to go through for it to be approved and become the law. Okay, so more intensive process. It involves not just the House of Commons, and it becomes law of the land, whereas motions, that's just a House thing. Yeah, it's typically a lot simpler than what has to happen to pass a bill, but... It's the House of Commons, so nothing is really simple. So with that in mind, how does the process work exactly? A motion comes to a vote, which means that sometimes MPs have to be summoned to the chamber of the House to vote. It's kind of cool. Lights in the Parliament building blink on and off and these division bells (laughs) ring. That sounds like the end of recess at school or something. (laughs) I mean, do you have to line up? I don't think you have to line up, but you do have to stand up when you get there. And then you get counted either as a, a yay or a nay. And then from there, they basically figure out whether the motion is uh, passed. It is either carried or it's negatived. That's a Transformers (laughs) word there, if I've ever heard one. Yes, Paul, 258, 258. Nays, Colt, zero, okay. I declare the motion carried. Alrighty, well, I think I know about motions now. (laughs) Thanks, Beatrice. Thank you. This is a mid-roll ad, so you might be expecting us to sell you a mattress or some accounting software. Well, listen, we wish you good sleep and fiscal organization, but no, we're not going to sell you anything. This minute is for us, you and me. I'm Hannah, one of the producers of this show, and we want to tell you why we made this podcast. See, the Samara Center for Democracy is on a mission to secure a resilient democracy with an engaged public and responsive institutions. What does that mean? Well, the Samara Center wants to make it easier for you to talk about Canada's democracy and participate in it. So talk to us. Tell us why you're listening to this show. It's simple to do. I know you've got your phone in your hand right now. Post about Humans of the House and tag us on Instagram and Twitter at the Samara Center. That's at T-H-E-S-A-M-A-R-A-C-E-N-T-R-E. We know why we're doing this work. Tell us why you're listening. Hashtag humans of the house. Okay, put yourself back in an MP's shoes for a second. Let's say, against all odds, you did it. You have your office in Ottawa with a brilliant team of staff. Hi! And you found an office in your writing and your writing staff. Hi! 
are already hard at work. They're helping your constituents with things like immigration, getting passports, settling loved ones, accessing employment insurance and veterans benefits. It's Monday. So what's your week looking like? Where are you supposed to be? When Parliament is in session, Monday morning usually finds MPs en route to Ottawa. While in Ottawa, MPs follow a routine schedule called the Daily Order of Business. From Monday to Thursday, they're all in the House of Commons at 2 p.m. There's member statements. Basically, MPs can give short speeches to the House. That's followed by question period, QP. This is probably the part of an MP's duties you're most familiar with because we see it all the time on the news. In four decades, when will the government realize the Canadians are out of money and the party's over? Here. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition seems to have amnesia because over the past two and a half years, it has been this government that has supported Canadians. Outside of question period, the rest of an MP's time in Ottawa is spent on house duty, in committees, and in their offices. I know, that's a lot to take in, so let's break those down. Your average MP is a part of at least one parliamentary committee. These are where members from across party lines come together to study bills and different issues. Then they report back to the House of Commons. A lot of MPs say that committee work is one of the best parts of the job. We'll find out why on a future episode. As for house duty, here's how Kennedy Stewart explains it. All MPs have house duty where you actually have to go sit in the House of Commons because they have to have a minimum number of MPs in the House. So you sit there for, I can't remember what the shift is, but it's something like six hours or something. So you are sitting in the House of Commons, often with uh, very long-winded speeches that are totally scripted. There's no chance for dialogue. So you use that opportunity to answer emails from constituents or, like in my case, write books. So when people accuse politicians of just sitting around, they should know that this is literally a requirement of the job. The speeches that take place while MPs are on house duty can cover a huge range of topics from supplying weapons to foreign governments to debates about the mountain pine beetle in BC. And one last thing while we're still in Ottawa, caucus meetings. Every Wednesday morning, parties gather all their members to meet, talk strategy, and come up with ideas for laws. This includes the party leader, all of the MPs, and all of the senators from that party. The typical workday for an MP is supposed to be 10 hours long, 8.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. But it's pretty common to have a 12-hour day while Parliament is in session. And it doesn't stop there. The work week is done. MPs have made it to Friday. TGIF, right? Well... Thursday night is usually when MPs make the trek back to their ridings. Some MPs stay in Ottawa most of Friday. If your riding is in Ottawa or somewhere nearby, that's no problem. But Canada has six time zones. There's no direct flight from Ottawa to Whitehorse. If you're lucky with the connections, you can maybe get there in nine hours. But most trips will take you closer to 12 and have two stops along the way. Here's Kennedy Stewart breaking down what it would take for him to get back to the Vancouver area. Coming from British Columbia, I was flying probably 15 hours a week for nine months of the year. That kind of takes a toll on you after a while. You're away from your family a lot, especially if you're from the West Coast or the North. It's especially taxing in terms of the travel. You have lots of time to do work or get to know people on the plane because you're, you're on there for five or six hours during your flight and did a lot of writing on the plane too. So great news if you're an aspiring MP and also an aspiring author. But otherwise, think back to your last long trip and the journey itself. You're tired, you feel gross, and then there's the jet lag. Picture that, but twice a week. This schedule varies depending on your role. If an MP only has one role in Parliament, they are called a backbench MP or backbencher. 
and their travel routine is largely going between Ottawa and their riding. But some MPs are also cabinet ministers or parliamentary secretaries. We'll break down what they do next episode. But for now, know that they have additional duties that can up their travel and work hours. For example, here's Matt DeCourcy describing a typical Friday from when he was an MP for Fredericton. It was routine for me to get home Friday around 7, 8 o'clock, like through my time in office, because I eventually ended up being a parliamentary secretary, had to stick around Friday mornings, and then I'd race to fly from Ottawa to Toronto, Toronto to Fredericton, get in my car, and i go right to my folks' place and kind of debrief the week with them around the kitchen table, right? And that, uh, mm-hmm. that was always the way that I got reconnected to my community because my mother would have lots to share about what was going on in the local community. Speaking of connecting with community, that's how MPs spend their weekends. A typical Saturday can be packed full of local events. If you've met your MP, I'm guessing you met at a local barbecue, street fair, charity event, business opening. MPs also use the weekends to meet with local organizations and hear their constituents' concerns. And then, it's Monday again. They're back on the plane to Ottawa. I feel tired just recapping all of that. Now, stop me if you've heard this one before. Everything changed once the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Some of the MPs we spoke to had their time in office dominated by COVID. They were learning how things worked as everything was changing around them. James Cumming was elected in Edmonton Centre in 2019. He only had a few months of pre-pandemic MP life before it all went online. Very little of my time in the House of Commons was in the House of Commons. You know, initially after being elected, we, we went to, you know, full sittings for a few months and then COVID hit. So it became the culture of Zoom. And uh, it, so you, you really didn't have that interaction. Um, but, um, you know, it, it would have been good to have a better sense of how to build those relationships, and particularly with opposition members. And I, and I started to build some of them while I sat on committees and when I was vice chair to try and, you know, um, get some things done. Uh, but uh, it was predominantly a, a, a Zoom environment. How do MPs get things done? A key way is by collaborating. And with COVID, James and many others missed out on building those crucial relationships face to face. They missed out on connecting with constituents too. That was incredibly difficult because you weren't doing events. Constituents aren't going to sign up to a Zoom call. They'll come out to a community event uh, that's something that, you know, they enjoy to do, bring their families out, and you'd be able to see them and, and do things with them and meet their entire family. The impression is that everybody thinks everybody's on social media, and they're not. You know, that, yeah. They're spending most of their time with their families and doing what they want to do. Whereas those interactions you would have, whether they be with um, community leagues or at business events, you know, that's where you get to hear a lot more and, and have a lot more interaction. So it was hard to stay in touch with them. You would certainly stay in touch with them if they had a specific issue that you were working with, and then you'd have that one-on-one. But the majority of your constituents are not engaged with government every day. You know, they're not. They're living their lives and trying to get things done. Um, they don't wake up in the morning saying, you know, I better call James Cumming today because he's going to make the world move. Those events pre-COVID were uh, very important. And, um, and it's good to see that we're back to some semblance of that again, because I think people are starting to get their lives back. We are just at the start of our journey with these dozen MPs, but already so much has happened. Let's take stock. MP life is nonstop. There's tons of travel, there's 10 or 12 hour days, a lot to read, so much pressure. National, sometimes global stakes, and not enough training. 
And for some, once they had a handle on it, it didn't matter because a global pandemic made them have to learn a whole new way to do the job. On top of all that, many MPs struggled with belonging, a persistent feeling that the House of Commons wasn't meant for them. Here's Selena. You may remember her uncle describing her audacity. And he looks at this little black girl from Grenada in her leather and her stilettos. After her swearing-in ceremony, Selena's first few weeks on Parliament Hill were tough. I walked through the space and didn't see anything that represented our contribution as Black communities to the country. You know, no physical representation that we had ever been there or made any political, social, economic contribution to the development of this land. And that for me was very stark. It, I mean, the, the concrete structure itself is very cold and uninviting, but to not see yourself, to not see any representation of who you are, knowing that you've been here for over 400 years, not to see nothing was almost intentional. And so I internalized that right from the beginning. While adjusting to this new home, new lifestyle, new responsibilities, there was also a sense of being an outsider. Selena was the only Black woman there. Being an only at your workplace, at such a big and crucial workplace, can be incredibly lonely. And in fact, I, I often joke about the fact that when I see Kim Campbell's picture, because she's, she's the only person that kind of represented part of my intersecting identities. Kim Campbell was Canada's first and only woman prime minister. I'd walk by the picture and be like, hey, Kim, how's it going? Are you hanging okay? Right? <laughs> I kind of joke about it, but I really took that in. I really took in the intentionality of, around the omission of us. Chances are, if you didn't want to run for office before you started listening, you probably still don't especially if your community is underrepresented in politics already. It's understandable to ask, why would someone do this? I knew a bit about the culture already before I got there. That's Romeo Saganash. He represented the riding of Abitibi Bay James, Nunavik EU, in northern Quebec. The, one of the things I was adamant about, and this came from a very kind and generous wisdom and advice from my late mom was that, well, you're going there, but you need to focus on what, you, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? She understood that it was an important platform for anybody, as a matter of fact. It's an important platform because you have access to media, you're a public figure from there on. Not that I wasn't before that. She advised me to use that platform well for the better of not only my constituents, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, but also for the better of Canada. Romeo is Cree and represented a huge number of Indigenous constituents. Part of being true to his mom's advice was speaking Cree in the House. Upon that advice, one of the first things I did when I uh, on the first day of Parliament, was to walk into the house and laid my computer and iPhone on, on my desk. Did not take a seat right away, but I walked over to the clerk's table, which is right in front of the speaker's chair. And uh, I asked the clerk of the house whether or not I could ask my questions and do my speeches in Cree. We all knew what the answer was. This was back in 2011, when the House of Commons only offered live interpretation in Canada's two official languages. So basically, the answer was a flat no. She informed me by saying, Romeo, you're, you're a jurist. Uh, you know that the two official languages of this place is French and English. I said, sure, I understand that, but uh, I mean... Uh, here's a language that has been spoken for more than 7,000 years. And I can't even speak it in this place. 
I thought it was called the House uh, of People of the People of Canada. <laughs> uh, am I not part of, of that? Anyway, that, that was the initial discussion. But I had proposed over the years different mechanisms, different avenues and ideas to allow that, including uh, for the, the clerk in, in the House of Commons to ask for a legal constitutional opinion on whether or not I had the right to speak my language in that place. So that journey alone took almost eight years to finally arrive at, at a solution. And, and it's interesting because one of the things we found out through the committee that studied the possibility of this happening, PROC, which is the, the, main, uh, the main committee of the House Procedures and House Affairs, um, we found out through that process that uh, the Bureau of Interpretation of the House of Commons has a bank of over 225 Indigenous interpreters in over 25 languages. So everything was already there. It was just a matter of accepting and how we can do it uh, at that time. So now it's possible. It took eight years of work for MPs to be able to use these languages in the House, some of the oldest languages spoken on this land. Romeo can still hear the legacy of this change today when he visits the House of Commons. I was at the House of Commons just uh, on Wednesday, I went to the question period, and Laurie Didelut, who's the uh, MP for uh, Nunavut, did her member's statement uh, entirely in Inuktitut. That was a proud moment, powerful and proud moment. Are MPs being set up to succeed? In our survey, a few former MPs told us that they liked their onboarding, that there was joy in meeting new colleagues and getting advice from former parliamentarians. There was awe in taking in their new surroundings, a sense of accomplishment in finally achieving their dream. But so many found their first days to be overwhelming and isolating. From what we've heard, the average welcome to Parliament leaves a lot to be desired. What would Parliament look like if our MPs were well supported and prepared to hit the ground running? How many more would stay in politics and how much more would get done? And what if all MPs felt welcomed as they are? We'll explore this question more in our next episode when we do a deep dive on the workplace culture of Parliament Hill. The House of Commons is like the worst place I've ever worked. I still think it was the best place I worked at. Is it respectful? Is it safe? And for who? Big thanks to all the former MPs and thank you for listening to Humans of the House. This podcast is produced by Media Girlfriends for the Samara Centre for Democracy. I'm Sabrina Dellen, Executive Director of the Samara Centre. Executive Producers of this podcast are Hannah Sung and Garvia Bailey. Associate Producer is Elena Hudgens-Lyle. Research is by Manager Dr. Beatrice Wayne and Coordinator Vijay Kumar at the Samara Centre. And our Sound Engineer is Gabby Clark. Theme music was composed by Project Whatever. A special thanks goes to the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians, Charlie Feldman, Bill Young, Michael McMillan, Ruth Ostrauer, Jennifer Jamblanco, and Nanaba Duncan. This episode included clips from Bloomberg, The Ottawa Citizen, and CBC. We are also grateful for funding from Heritage Canada and Rosamond Ivy. The Samara Centre for Democracy is a nonpartisan registered charity. Our mission is to realize a resilient democracy with an engaged public and responsive institutions. To support our work, visit samaracenter.ca and click donate. This podcast is part of the MP Exit Interview Project. To learn more about this work and other research, visit our website and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the Samara Center. If you, like us, care about the human side of politics, help spread the word about our show. 
rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You'd be surprised how much it helps. Tell your friends. And if you teach, share the show with your class. Thank you for listening.